Yogiri Takatu is your average cool, calm, and collected individual who no one seems to respect. As a high schooler with normal grades, Takatu was used to being cast aside in the shadows. His innate calm and collected attitude enabled him to sleep through anything happening around him, including accidents and even fires. One day, while he is on a school trip with his friends, Takatu falls asleep again like before and completely misses an otherworldly event happening before his sleepy eyes. While he's asleep, he finds himself in a dream of sorts. In this dream, Takatu finds himself as a youngster, walking through a highly secured facility, walking towards a large door. As he walks quietly towards the door, everyone around him dies out by his mere presence. He stops midway and asks an unidentified person for a person named Asaka. Before the person could say anything, the locked door in front of Yogiri Takatu opened wide to reveal his Asaka being held at gunpoint by another lady who didn't want him near her at all. The lady forbade Yogiri from coming too close to her and Asaka. However, Asaka spoke up and asked the lady why she would threaten her brother like that. Yogiri, who's been watching the lady point her gun at his sister's head all along, gets pissed and calmly tells her to die. At that instant, the lady holding his sister hostage loses her life as she falls. Asaka looks at her brother in shock and wonders what happened to her attacker. Yogiri rushes towards Asaka, hugs her, and tells her to come home with him. So, Yogiri Takatu supposedly can command instant death on any target. This ability, which he calls instant death on any target, allows him to wish death on anybody troubling him, and also has a certain dark power to carry out the wish instantly. He used this power against his sister's attacker whose death was so swift that even Asaka couldn't wrap her head around what happened. After saving his sister in his dream, Yogiri's dream ends swiftly as his colleague, Tomochika, wakes him up to see what has happened to them. Yogiri mistakes Tomochika to be some stuck-up lady trying to disturb his peaceful sleep. However, he stops for a while and looks around to check out what happened around him. Upon closer inspection, he finds two people, one male and one female, lying unconscious on the ground and asks Tomochika for some pointers on what happened. Before she could speak, a creature Yogiri identified as a wyvern attacks the male lying unconscious on the floor of the bus and kills him. Yogiri takes a microphone from the floor and throws it at the wyvern's tail so it can leave his dear friend alone. The wyvern receives the hit and takes to the sky to plan a final attack on Tomochika and her prince Charming. Mere seconds before the wyvern lands on him, Yogiri feels Tomochika's soft boobs on his hands and decides she's worth saving. He takes out his special grimoire and casts the spell into existence. Die, he said, and almost immediately the spell took effect and the wyvern died that instant. After taking care of the wyvern, Yogiri returns to his normal self and tells Tomochika to wake up. The scared lady wakes up and checks outside the bus to see the wyvern's corpse. Surprised, she asks Yogiri for an explanation. But then again, Yogiri isn't interested in explaining things to her, yet as he wants her to calm down before talking to one another. With this, he takes out his game device and plays some games on it. This pisses Tomochika so much that she orders him to drop the game immediately so they can talk better. After chilling out for a while, Tomochika finally speaks up and asks him to stop gaming so they can discuss the matter properly. After getting each other's attention, Tomochika begins their horror story. It was a late night drive, and Tomochika seemed to be enjoying herself so far. At some point in the drive, the bus enters a dark tunnel and appears in a different place. As everyone struggles to understand what happened, the bus stops suddenly, and Tomochika asks her friend, Mikochi, for some clarification on what happened. Just then, a sage from the new world they just got summoned into, Shion, shows up and kills their teacher right in front of them to calm them down. She warns them against talking out of line so they don't end up like their teacher. After getting everyone's attention, Shion begins her meeting with the confused kids. She tells them that she summoned them to this world so they can train for a short period and become sages like her. She then makes a joke about her attack power being 530,000 points and waits for the students to laugh. When she hears nobody laugh, she gets pissed and kills their driver to punish them. It becomes clear to everyone that the lady standing in front of them is a crazy bitch with a god complex. After giving everyone her free speech, she points her hands at the students and grants most of them except Tomochika, Yogiri, and two other students, new sage powers. As she explains their new powers to them, Tomochika and the others start wondering why they were left out. She asks her friend, Makochi, about whatever is in front of them, and Makochi tells her all about her status and the likes. After granting them the powers, Shion urges them to take training seriously so they can become sage in just a mere month as that's the timeline they're being given. Tomochika raises her hand to ask Shion about herself. 
Shion, upon realizing that Tomochika is one of the exceptions, tells her to just get over it and continue living or else. She will turn her into livestock and wring all her magic powers out of her body. Tomochika keeps her mouth shut and starts learning to accept her new reality. Before leaving, Shion gives them an hour to get used to their new status and powers before they face their first mission. After she leaves, the entire bus is thrown into pandemonium with Tomochika and her friend Mikochi, working together to figure out what their first mission is going to be. After checking her pamphlet, Mikochi finds out a dragon will be coming to attack them once the timer reaches zero. Suddenly, Suguru with a general status steps up and organizes the bus. He then tells everyone to write their abilities on a piece of paper and hand it over to him so they can assess it and formulate a strategy based on everyone's abilities. Once that's done, the two remaining people without powers complain about their powerlessness. Eventually, once all's been said and done, everyone gets out of the bus leaving the powerless ones in there. Initially, Tomochika and the others struggle to understand what is happening, but then again, Suguru shows up and tells them the reality of their situation. He lets them know that they're to be kept there as bait for the dragon when it attacks, so that the other, more useful ones will escape before any harm comes to them. The other male dude without powers tried to force his way through, but then Suguru displays his extraordinary powers and forbids him from leaving the bus. To make matters worse for them, he has Asuha, a beauty fanatic, use her magic on all four of them so they look ridiculously tasty to the dragon coming for them. Once that's done, Suguru turns his back on his colleagues and locks the door while leaving the bus. Shortly after he left, the wyvern attacked the bus, punched a hole on top of it, and attacked the two powerless ones. With that, Tomochika ends her story and lets Yogiri do his thing now that he knows what's up. Yogiri gets up and tells Tomochika that it's safe to get out now that the dragon is dead. Tomochika looks at him with a shy look and asks him if he did something to the dragon outside. Yogiri spells out some crap about crashing and dying before stepping out of the bus with Tomochika. Outside, Yogiri checks around and figures out that they have three places to get to, the hill, the city, or the forest. Yogiri realizes that they have to avoid the forest if they want to stay safe. Tomochika, on the other hand, spots three of their classmates flying close to them and informs Yogiri. Yogiri asks Tomochika to tell him if he's to take them down at that instant. Tomochika is very surprised at his answer and forbids him from doing such a thing. Just because they wished them all death doesn't mean they should wish them death in return. Yogiri warns her not to get her hopes up as they could, as well be arseholes looking to bully both of them. Well, Yogiri was right as the three of them, Daimon, the healer, Ryusuke, the hero, and Fukuhara, the necromancer, all came down complaining about Tomochika being alive. According to them, they were to use Tomochika's corpse for their zombie experiment, so they could touch her boobs or something like that. Ryusuke displays his impressive fire powers for both Yogiri and Tomohika to see so they can fear him. If only he'd known who he was up against. Well, Ryusuke and his goons order Tomochika to come closer to them so they can carry out their nasty experiments on her. At this point, Yogiri steps in and promises to put them in a talking situation soon. With this, he points his hand at Ryusuke and orders him to fall to the ground and die. Initially, his friends laugh about his command, but after a few seconds, Ryusuke falls to the ground lifeless. They try attacking Yogiri one more time, but then again, Yogiri orders the second guy to die, leaving the Fatso Diamond alive for his entertainment. Before killing him, Yogiri asks Diamond to check if his friends are still alive. Diamond tries to use his healing powers to get his friends back to normal. Sadly, his plans didn't work, as his friends were already dead. Tomochika also gets the gist and eventually figures out that Yogiri killed the dragon earlier. Damon tries to blame Yogiri for killing his friends, but then again, Yogiri reminds him that they attacked attacked him first, and he was simply defending himself. Damon still tries a sneak attack on Yogiri, but then Yogiri stops him and lets him know that he can discern anyone with murderous intentions towards him, so he shouldn't even try the sneak attack. At this point, Damon falls to the ground, writhing in pain. Yogiri asks him why he was so full of himself after getting his gift. And Damon tells him it's because they've been to another world before in their sleep, but that time they were only out for a few hours. Yogiri tries to kill him so he can join his friends, but Daimon begs him to let him live. He tries getting Tomochika to stand in for him, but when that fails, he takes out a collar and puts it on himself so he can be Tomochika's servant and follow her everywhere. Scared, Tomochika asked Damon if there was a way she could stop being his master. Damon tells her she's going to have to transfer ownership to another person. Tomochika thinks about it a little and grants Yogiri ownership of her new dog. Yogiri orders Damon to go to the forest full of monsters and sit there in the meantime. Before leaving, he tells him to keep his mouth shut while he's at it and also leaves all his gold and treasure with them so they can put it to good use. After he leaves, Tomochika talks to Yogiri about the status quo and discusses betrayal 
skills and the like. Tomochika gets a little curious once, and asks Yogiri why he saved her earlier. Yogiri disappoints her by telling her he did to save her boobs which were soft the entire time. Tomochiki's face blushes red as the scene goes black. In the next scene, Shion wakes up to see her assistant, Yuichi, who had an update for her. He reports the death of Ryusuke and his other goon together with the other two powerless male and female students that died with them. Shion gets a little worried over what could have caused the death of two S-rank heroes, but eventually, she dies the idea of something or someone bad happening and just goes back to sleep after dismissing Yuichi. After trekking for miles on end, Tomochika and Yogiri finally make it to the entrance of the village late in the evening. There, they find the guards preparing to close the gates to restrict further entry into the village, and this gets Tomochika very worried over what to do. They needed to get to safe ground so they could be protected against the dangerous creatures of the night, plaguing the forest and the hills when no one was looking. Tomochika holds Yogiri's hands and rushes towards the guards before they close the gate on them. Upon asking further questions, the guards answer them in a language neither of them can understand. Thankfully, a few hand gestures and nods help the guards understand what Tomochika was trying to pass across. Soon after, Another good-for-nothing called Masahiko shows up to check up on the castaways. He runs his mouth for a few seconds, boasting of his newfound abilities, and then tells both Tomochika and Yogiri about the gate fee normal citizens are to pay to enter the city. However, since Tomochika and Yogiri were pretty much sage candidates, Masahiko was willing to let them pass through the space, free of charge. Before leaving, Yogiri stops to ask Masahiko to tell him where the sage candidates went so they can join them in a jiffy. As expected, Masahiko tells them nothing. Yogiri thanks him for keeping his mouth shut and letting them be. Yogiri, upon realizing how useless Masahiko is to him at the moment, gets up, thanks Masahiko for nothing, and takes his leave with Tomochika. Before he gets too far, Masahiko stops them and invites Tomochika to come spend the night at his inn. Tomochika's face lights up in fear, and she immediately holds Yogiri's hands before running out of there with him. Shortly afterward, when they are at a safe distance, Yogiri asks her why she acted frisky back then. Tomochika tells him she was scared he was going to act out of control and use his instant death power to kill Masahiko and his band of merry goons. Yogiri tells her to cut him some slack so she can stop thinking he's evil all the time. With that, the conversation is closed to further discussion and the duo continue their walk through the vibrant town. Amidst their travels, they come across a street runt, Mireyu, who appears to have cat ears attached to her head. Mireyu figures out from their appearance that they are new to the town so she decides to pull a fast one on them by offering to take them on tours around the town and also advertise luxury stalls around town so they can buy things from there and enjoy themselves. Her catch? Well, Mireyu tells them she does such nefarious things just to get with male sage candidates and enjoy their third legs. Tomochika, Upon hearing the rubbish come out of the cat-eared girl's mouth, sighs in regret and quickly accepts Mireyu for whoever she is. She then turns to Yogiri and asks him what they're to do. In the meantime, Yogiri tells her to do what she wants. So, Tomochika goes on a shopping spree and allows Mireyu to take her all around town. The shopping spree ends by nightfall, and Yogiri and Tomochika struggle to move their merchandise elsewhere. Mireyu leaves them for a short break and returns with her friends to deal with the new rich kids who just came to town. Yogiri keeps his cool as usual and makes sure to protect Tomochika while trying to figure out their intentions. He throws a jab at Tomochika, blaming her for choosing to believe someone like Mireyu. While Tomochika defends herself, one of the mobsters speaks up and blames the gifted sages for always being so full of themselves and causing havoc everywhere in the town. He admits to being unable to do anything while they're around, but now that a bunch of normal people, Eka Tomochika and Yogiri, are around, they can take their frustration out on them and make sure to steal all the good stuff they bought for themselves. After listening to the man spill out all the crap he's made of, Yogiri calmly warns him to stay calm so that he can lash out his ultimate judgment on them. This statement makes the bandits laugh out loud as they underestimated the scrawny-looking dude and his girlfriend, threatening to end them in an instant. As a final note of warning, Tomochika tried speaking some sense into Mireyu before she and her people made the greatest mistake of their lives. Still, Mireyu refused to back down. She was under the impression that Tomochika and her travel partner were weak people, with nobody and nowhere left to go. Eventually, Yogiri lashes out his judgment and starts by commanding the people behind him to die. Almost immediately, Every mobster behind him loses their life. To reduce the impact of his power, Yogiri commands the next person after them to go down half dead. Despite that, the poor cat dude still died. Yogiri tries taking another approach by killing the limbs off some of the guys and people there with them. Their eyes, legs, arms, shoulders, 
and the like. At this point, even Tomochika was scared to death of Yogiri's powers. He still doesn't stop there as he continues pointing his fingers and ordering the people in front of him to get down to their deaths. Mireyu tries using emotional blackmail to beg for her life, but Yogiri wasn't about to have that. He points his finger at them one more time and orders Mireyu and the last man standing to die. This command wasn't instantaneous so the duo thought Yogiri had fumbled. As such, they turned their backs on Yogiri and ran as fast as they possibly could. Tomochika complains to Yogiri about letting them go. Yogiri bursts her bubble and tells her not to think he let them go. Mere seconds after running and getting on a rooftop, Mireyu meets her demise and falls to her death. The other partner after her also loses his life leaving Yogiri and Tomachika free to leave. Soon after, however, some guards patrolling the streets caught up in the fight at the alleyway and stopped Yogiri and Tomochika, who they thought were part of the gifted. From moving till they were cleared by their investigation, their leader, Edelgart, tries to blame them, but then Tomochika confronts her and asks her why she never intervened to help them out. Edelgart lets them know that she was waiting patiently with her team, so they could step into the fight and save them, as they were being sold as slaves to the enemies. As she continues running her mouth, calling Tomochika and Yogiri Sagas, her second-in-command, who has the appraisal skill, stops her from talking and reveals Yogiri and Tomochika's identity to them. Edelgard, after realizing they weren't sages, stops talking and continues patrolling the streets with her people. The second-in-command apologizes on Edelgard's behalf, and continues moving forward. Yagiri asks Jorge, the second in command, to make it up to them by finding them a place to stay while they check out the bodies in front of them. In the next scene, Tomochika and Yogiri are taken to a beautiful castle to stay for the night. Before settling in, Yogiri asks Tomochika if she would want to share a room with him. Tomochika's face blushes red and she tells him no. Yogiri refuses to press on and just continues to find a suitable room for himself. After finding rooms for themselves, Tomochika visits hers and finds it to be large enough for herself and Yogiri. As she lies on the bed to chill out, her mind begins to travel far as she thinks about having a romantic relationship with Yogiri. Then again, she remembers how perverse Yogiri Yogiri can get with her. She quickly brushes her mind off the thought before looking up to find a floating person resembling her sister. She calls the person her sister, but then, the spirit speaks up and calls herself Mokomoko, wife of the Danora school's founder's son, who's also an ancestral spirit sent from above to come guard Tomochika in her journey. Tomochika spends the rest of the afternoon getting acquainted with her so-called guardian angel, and asks her why she didn't show herself earlier. The spirit admits to being very afraid of Yogiri and his terrible powers. She fears if she's made a mistake and startled Yogiri with her appearance, he might command her to die. Tomochika reasons with her logic and promises to introduce him to her the following day, so he gets used to her. Moving on, Mokomoko tells Tomochika she was the one who prevented the gift from getting to Tomochika. Tomochika throws a fuss and asks her why she did such a bad thing. Mokomoko tells her having supernatural powers is all fun and games until she realizes that she's being a puppet for the sages. Besides, she couldn't let Tomochika, the heir to their martial arts school, get handed over to a crazy sage. Their conversation went on and on all through the night. The next morning, Tomochika wakes up, packs her bags, and heads downstairs to the lobby to see Yogiri discussing a few things with the competent hotel concierge. She hands them tickets for their train to the royal capital, and helps them keep their money for investment purposes. Tomochika and Yogiri board the train and head on their long journey to the royal capital. While on the train, Mokomoko appears and starts making a fuss out of nothing. Yogiri, however, keeps quiet and tells Tomochika about the updates on their classmates' training taking place in the forest. A few minutes later, Yogiri ducks and holds Tomochika to protect her against the incoming attack. Elsewhere, Sage Lane, a vampire sage, and her band of soldiers observe one of the survivors from Yogiri's attack in the alleyway that night. Apparently, Yogiri had commanded that guy's eyes to die and lose their sight, and Layin was up to return the guy's eyesight to him. She tries removing the old one and replacing it with a better eye, but it doesn't work. So, what does she do now? Well, Lane decides to turn the dude into one of her kind. She takes out her fangs and sticks them in the man's neck, turning him into a vampire. Even still, nothing happens. Before they could try another trick, a hero who'd been hunting Lain and her people for ages appeared at their building and threatened to kill Lain one more time. Meanwhile, Tomochika and Yogiri's train comes to a stop, and the announcer calms them down so they can wait out the sage who is busy battling the aggressor. Yogiri takes Tomochika out of the train to observe the situation. Tomochika tells him to use his power on the sage and aggressor, so they can stop causing havoc on the train. Yogiri refuses to do such a thing, and instead lets the guy be. Just then, the sage in training, Santaru shows up close to the civilians, and murders them all in cold blood, simply because they were trying to get out of trouble. The hero, on the other hand, 
lands a few attacks on Lane, and then unleashes a final blow on her, destroying the building in the process. After taking out several innocents, Santaru turns to Yogiri and his girl, who seem to be the last ones standing, and tells them to bow down before him as the only powerful being present at the moment. Yogiri calls him out on his bullshit, and calls him irritating for thinking he's above the others just because he was granted a few toys to play with. With that, Yogiri orders the sage to die, and when he does, the aggressor attacking the sage earlier shows up and asks to discuss a few things with Yogiri. The hero, after realizing that his attack failed, loses all hope and surrenders himself to Lane who just threw him out her window before ordering her men to go search for Yogiri. In the meantime, Yogiri asks the robot if he can take them out of this terrible world they're in. The robot gives them a bunch of reasons why he can't do such a thing to him. Yogiri and Tomochika discuss a few more things before calling it a night. Later that night, Shion and Lane discuss Yogiri's uprising. They get a little worried and Lain tells Shion to take precautionary measures to make sure they take care of him. Shion, on the other hand, tells her not to interfere with the sage students. Instead, she would be much more useful if she could take care of the darkness in the capital Hanabusa in the meantime. Shion leaves shortly afterward, and Lane hires Mayasuki to go to Hanabusa with his army of the undead so they can make their findings there. Elsewhere, Yogiri and Tomochika sit down after trekking for a while and examine the sword-like item they got from the robot earlier. Mokomoko tells Tomochika that she got the item from the robot's skins and this makes Tomochika shriek. The next morning, Tomochika and Yogiri continue trekking for an extended period until the city of Hanabusa appears on the horizon. Before entering the bright city, Tomochika stops and asks Yogiri about his plans for leveling up and becoming stronger. Yogiri Tyril tells her there's no need for that as he sometimes subconsciously uses his powers to take down those with evil intent toward both of them. As proof, he turns back and shows Tomochika the countless monsters and demons he's been killing on their way through the forest to get to the city. Tomochika throws a fuss over Yogiri doing such a thing without telling her and makes him promise to inform her before using it next time. Then, she asks him about the limits of his power just so she can know when to step in and help him out in a hard situation. To her surprise, Yogiri lets her know that his power is limitless, and he can use it even if he's half dead, as long as his mouth still works. Yogiri, Tomochika, and Mokomoko head into the heart of the city and search around town for a suitable place for them to stay. Mokomoko checks out the barriers used to secure the city's borders and is surprised by how complex the structure is. Tomochika, on the other hand, continues searching through the city's high-rise buildings and finds a luxury hotel standing in the middle of town. Without thinking twice, the trio walks into the hotel and meets someone rather unexpected in the lobby. One of their classmates, Tachibana, aka the most pompous dude in their entire class, recognizes Tomochika and shows up to say hi. Tomochika gets a little surprised and asks Tachibana what he was doing away from the forest. Tachibana told her that he took a different route from the others so he could level up faster. According to him, there was no need for him to work with people who don't level up efficiently like he does. Tomochika gets a little shocked at this realization, but then she keeps her cool and waits for someone else to speak up. Suddenly, one of Tachibana's lady aides, Erika, gets jealous of Tachibana's fondness for Tomochika and lashes out at one poor Tomochika. Tachibana stops her from running her mouth too much so she doesn't end up insulting Tomochika. Seconds later, Another one of his lady aides speaks up and praises him for taking care of the rude people in front of them all. On hearing all the terrible things they had to say about them, Tomochika and Yogiri get curious as to who these stuck-up middle school girls were. Tachibana takes a moment to introduce his bodyguards, aka aides to the lot. According to him, they were selected to fit his rank and protect him at all costs. Tachibana gives the ladies some space to introduce themselves. Erika goes first as the fifth rank and showcases how sassy she can be when things get to her head. As for the fourth rank, Stephanie shows a kind of warmth one gets from feminine girls. The third rank, Chelsea, showcases herself to be the best creep I've seen in a while. Up next is the second rank, Euphemia, who's a lady who acts like she's tough but she's sweet inside. The first rank bodyguard, who's their captain, calls herself Riza and forbids Tomochika from being too close to their master. Tomochika clears the smoke and asks Tachibana to control his girls. Tachibana steps up and tells his girls to shut the hell up so he can get some breathing space. At that instant, Yogiri whispers something in Tomochika's ears, asking her if Tachibana is someone they can trust, seeing as he was amongst those who abandoned them on the bus earlier. Tomochika urges him to calm down and accept the cocky Tachibana the way he is since that's how he's always been in high school. Yogiri calms down and turns back to face Tachibana. To their surprise, Tachibana asks Tomochika out to be his mistress. At this point, Tomochika breaks into pieces as she never thought he would stoop so low to ask such a funny question. To make matters worse, 
Tachibana invites Yogiri to be his manservant and entertain Tomochika just in case he's not there all the time to make her happy. Several thoughts run through the minds of Tomochika and Yogiri, but then again, they decide not to do anything rash. Tomochika asks him why he's so confident about his skills, and Tachibana tells her about his class, Dominator, which is known to be the strongest sage class ever. The Dominator class granted Tachibana the power to control lower-ranked opponents as his slaves. Tomochika politely lets him know she can't be his mistress. She moves on to ask him about his training experience, and Tachibana decides to tell her all about it. The night after they completed their first mission, an analyst called Haruto sat by Tachibana one night in the tavern, to give him some counsel on how to go about his dominator powers. Ever since his powers were known, people had been avoiding him so they wouldn't make enemies out of him. Haruto's way out was to purchase a large amount of level 1 servants and send them into battle. The more battles they win or lose, the more money and, most especially, the more allies they can build using their powers. Tachibana reasons well with Haruto's strategy and asks for his cut in the deal. Haruto tells him he's only looking out for a fellow sage and also wants to test out his strategy on a real human for starters. After relaying the information, he gets up and leaves. After listening to his story, Yogiri and Tomochika understand the reason behind his strategy. Tachibana asks Tomochika one more time to become his slave, but this time, Tomochika gives him a big no. Tachibana Tachibana gives her some time to think it over and give him a favorable answer soon. Following that, he leaves with his girls. After he's gone, Yogiri tries talking to Mochika into joining Tachibana's clan as he thinks she will be safer there with him than here with Yogiri. Tomochika gets pissed at Yogiri for saying such dirty words to her, and Yogiri quickly apologizes. Elsewhere, the origin blood vampire sage, Lain, finally arrives at the outskirts of Hanabusa to face the darkness approaching the city. Tomochika and her people check into a room and chill there till something bad happens. Yogiri falls asleep shortly in his own room. Tomochika gets super bored to the bone and asks Mokomoko if she could get out to receive fresh air. Mokomoko warns against such a thing, and just as Tomochika is about to say something, Mayasuki and his bunch of undead goons arrive in the city to take it down from the inside. Mayasuki sends his goons into the homes and alleyways of the normal citizens of the city so no one gets a chance to escape. Tomochika and Mokomoko stay in their room and watch the chaos manifest a few dozen floors below them. At the time, Erika sneaks up behind the room's entrance door after making herself invisible so she can spy on Tomochika and Mokomoko to discuss their thing. The unsuspecting ladies decide to sit this one out and make sure nothing happens to them. Mokomoko guilt trips Tomochika into thinking she did the wrong wrong thing staying inside when she knows she could have helped. Mokomoko senses someone at the entrance and encourages Tomochika to call Yogiri to come help her out before a fight breaks out. In the meantime, Yogiri is stuck in a dream about his family member. However, before he could go far in his dream, the phone rang. Yogiri picks up the call and heads out of his room after listening to Tomochika's call for help. He steps out in the corridor and looks around the room to find the person stalking them. When his normal eyes couldn't see the person, Yogiri decided to use his powers of perception to sniff the person out. After doing it for a few seconds, he sees Erika's silhouette standing in the hallway and immediately uses the instant death ability to take her out. Then. He knocks on the door and gets inside Tomochika's room. There, he tells her about his encounter with Erika and picks up the phone to dial the cleaning service to come check out the woman who collapsed in the corridor. This way, Yogiri can clear himself free of suspicions. A few kilometers from the hotel, Tachibana and his people are seen fighting in a labyrinth as they notice Erika's signal going dark. Before they could act on it, another monster attacked them. Before the cleaning service arrives, Yogiri and Tomochika step outside to check up on the lady Yogiri killed earlier and are shocked to find out that the person is none other than Erika. Scared, Yogiri advises Tomochika to go pack her bags so they can leave that area before Tachibana shows up with his girls to take them out. Before letting her go, he stops and asks her why she's unusually calm about the situation. Tomochika tells him it's probably because she's already used to such things by that time. Mokomoko also steps in to defend her master so Tomochika doesn't appear weakling. In the meantime, Tachibana takes down the monster that appeared before them flawlessly, and forces the monster to be under his control. He dishes out some orders to the monster and lets it go on its merry way. After that, he settles down with Euphemia to talk about Erika and her sudden disappearance. They pull up the footage Erika had of her moments before her death and are shocked to find out she fell and died without any struggle. Euphemia suggests to Tachibana that Erika was probably too jealous of Tomochika and decided to take matters into her own hands. Tachibana frowned at such behavior and wished she'd been better. Lane struggled to take down the darkness that appeared in the outskirts as all her attacks seemed to go right through the monster. Riza finds Tomochika and Yogiri trying to escape the hotel and traps them in an iceberg. To her surprise, 
Yogiri breaks himself out of the iceberg and gives her the benefit of the doubt. However, Riza attacks him one time, and Yogiri breaks her wand with his words. He places her in a terrible situation and makes her confess her secret weapons and even take them out of her breasts. Moving on, Yogiri asks her for the location of the other members of her group. It was then that Riza smirks and tells him to look above him. Suddenly, several killer dolls appeared around them and attacked them. Yogiri took down a few of them and then turned to Riza to take her down. The little one, Chelsea, tries sending more of her dolls to attack Yogiri, but then Yogiri takes down all of them and finds their master before taking her down as well. Tachibana notices the happenings in the hotel and realizes that Chelsea had sold information about them to Yogiri and Tomochika to save her skin. He calmly discusses Yogiri's terrible power with Euphemia, and listens to what she has to say. Euphemia tells him it's highly implausible for that kind of stuff to happen, so he shouldn't believe Yogiri one bit. Yogiri and Tomochika, on their way out, run into a room filled with bugs. Tomochika's fear of bugs kicks in, and she freaks the heck out at the sight of them. Yogiri worsens her fear by reminding her of the terrible things those bugs can do to her body system if care isn't taken. Tachibana sees everything happening in front and ignores his aide's warning to just let things be. He ignites the killer instinct in the bugs and commands them to attack Yogiri and Tomochika. Yogiri amplifies his powers and uses the link Tachibana has with his bugs, to pinpoint his location. He finds Tachibana in the labyrinth and orders him to die where he stands. Suddenly, Tachibana's smug look quickly turns pale as he loses his life in an instant. Even after killing Tachibana, the cockroaches still work just fine. Only this time, they're friendlies. Tomochika still freaks out at the sight of them and asks Yogiri to kill the roaches. Yogiri, however, leaves the roaches and moves on outside. After losing her master to Yogiri's attack, Euphemia decides to leave her impudent master and seek greener pastures. She gets to the entrance of the labyrinth and finds herself in the middle of nowhere with the darkness hovering in the air on its way to the city. Lain, who stopped fighting the monster, sees Euphemia and uses her powers to transform her into one of her kind. Meanwhile, Yogiri and Tomochika finally find the entire city in ruins as the zombies keep on chasing everyone all around town. In the meantime, Lain keeps trying her best to force Yogiri's hand. When Euphemia asks her why she is so keen on forcing his hand, Leon tells her she wants to see the extent of Yogiri's instant death power, and to gauge it well enough to see if it can kill her, an immortal vampire. Back in Hanabusa City, Yogiri and Tomochika are seen hiding in the alleyways spectating the terrible display of madness by the zombies out there. While Tomochika wonders how this happened, Yogiri thinks of a way out of the horrible city before it's too late. Mokomoko advises them not to be too concerned about the zombie people, and would be doing themselves some good if they just upped and left the city under the people's noses. While they contemplate the best course of action to take, the feudal lord of the city, Ryuta requests a meeting with Masayuki so they can discuss the current crisis plaguing the city. After getting in the same room with him, he asks Masayuki to tell him why he would attack a city that was placed under Ryuta's protection by Lord Lane herself. Masayuki, who's already a lunatic, laughs out loud and breaks the bad news to Ryuta. He tells him not to calm him down and not to make a fuss out of something as trivial as what's happening. Besides, they used to be comrades in arms before he died, so Masayuki sees no sense in Ryuta's anger. At this point, Ryuta knows there's no way he can reason with a brain-dead undead zombie, so he just turns his back on Masayuki and politely tells him to leave his city for him. It was then that Masayuki spilled the beans and told him that he was acting under Lion's direct orders. He then gets up from his seat and orders Ryuta to give him the key to the city. Ryuta gives him access to the key and lets him do what he wants with it. After acquiring the key, Masayuki stops his zombie dudes from destroying the city. He connects to the PA system all over the city and gets the attention of the people of Hanabusa. Then he introduces himself as a member of the Immortal Forces and brings the fugitives he's after to the people's knowledge. After showing them a wanted poster of Yogiri and Tomochika, he instructs the people to bring them to the tower in an hour. Failure to do so would mean Masayuki and his zombies resume their rampage. To prevent them from escaping the city, he lets the fugitives know that he's already locked the entrances and exits to the city, so there's no use trying to break them open. To end his speech, he gives the people two choices. They either bring Yogiri and Tomochika to him, or he turns them all into zombies without their knowledge. After his speech, Masayuki gets off the call to face an angry Ryuta, who condemns him for putting the people in harm's way. In his defense, 
Masayuki tells Ryuta that nobody would take him seriously if he didn't threaten him that way. He was only bluffing, and he hopes the people don't call his bluff, or he may be forced to resume his zombie apocalypse for real. At this point, Ryuta gets seriously pissed at the unfortunate turn of events and wishes things were different. Up next, Tomachika and Yogiri get a little worried and ponder over what could have caused their warrant to be released. Yogiri thinks about the facts a little bit, and realizes that he must be wanted due to the incessant killings he's been engaging himself in lately. If there's one thing he's certain of, it's that he needs to get out of there as quickly as he can. Just then, a few commoners find them lacking and attack Yogiri without thinking of the repercussions. One of them lunges at Yogiri but then loses his life moments before getting there. Tomochika complains a little about Yogiri's unorthodox killing method, and makes him wonder what Masayuki's plans could be sending normal humans to attack him. Suddenly things click in Yogiri's head, and he finally gets pissed enough to plan his revenge against Masayuki. The other two people run for dear life once they find out how outnumbered they are. Yogiri, on the other hand, gets on the way to the plaza in the city center, hoping to find Masayuki there and talk things with him. After walking with his partner for a little while, Yogiri finally arrives at the city plaza. He finds Masayuki there and stops to say hi. Masayuki, who's just very surprised to see his meal walk up to him so easily, gets bored and chastises Yogiri for taking the easy way out. Yogiri, on the other hand, wasn't there to be anybody's fodder. He makes his demands and tells Masayuki to arrange a train for him so they can get to the royal capital. While he's at it, he also urges him to release the barrier at the city gates so they can pass out of the city in peace. Masayuki gets surprised and angry at the effrontery Yogiri had to make demands despite him being in a pinch. Yogiri gets a little unhappy and decides to spare Masayuki's life if he helps them. This pisses Masayuki off so much that he stops any form of communication with Yogiri and summons his undead army to fight him. He was under the impression that Yogiri's instant death powers couldn't work on his army of the undead since they were already deceased. To his surprise though, Yogiri shocks everybody and orders the undead army to die. Ryuta, who was quiet the entire time, sees this and begs Yogiri to spare his life. While Masayuki wonders how his undead army kicked the bucket all at once, Yogiri ponders over the best answer to tell him. Eventually he comes up with an answer and tells Masayuki that his words affected them so simply because they were still moving, and as long as they moved, he had the power to kill them all over again. At this point, Masayuki begins to morph into another creature. Before he can finish his transformation, Yogiri orders him to die and gets the fight over before it even starts. After finishing his mission with Masayuki, Yogiri walks over to Ryuta and lets him know that he's only doing all these things for self-defense and would not need to do it if nobody came at him in the first place. Ryuta tells them that Lion was the one who sent Masayuki to kill them. Tomochika asks him about Shion, thinking both are the same person, but Ryuta clarifies things and lets them know that Lion is the owner and governor of the city. Moko Moko interrupts their discussion and tells them about the large spiritual energy that's amassing to attack this city that instant. Yogiri confirms Moko Moko's suspicions and notices the huge concentration of rage coming towards them from the people. This time, it seems the people of the city were hellbent on taking down Yogiri so they could be saved. Ryuta takes out the key to the city from Masayuki's pocket and tries activating the barrier so he can unlock them. But unfortunately for him, Lain was already controlling the barrier from the outside of the city. This spells bad news for all of them, as the entire city is now against them. Right outside the city, Euphemia warns her new master against making an enemy of someone like Yogiri. Surprised, Lain asks Euphemia how highly she rates Yogiri as an enemy, and Euphemia lets her know that Yogiri might as well be stronger than a mythical being. Lane takes one last look at Euphemia's eyes, and asks her if she's planning to run away or not. She forbids her from doing just that, and wonders why she's so scared of Yogiri. In the meantime, Yogiri and Tomochika become surrounded by the murderous humans, with many of them coming at him with murderous intent. Yogiri orders the first few of them to die, which they do. While keeping a calm and collected postery, Yogiri notices how badly Ryuta is taking the killings and tries to calm him down. Lane, on the other hand, decides to amp things up a little bit before the darkness she was fighting before entering the city. With that, she splits her existence in half and orders her second self to fly up to the sky and multiply herself as she sees fit. Besides, if her body is burned to a crisp, she can regenerate her body completely. Her second self flies up to the sky and divides itself into several parts. Yogiri notices this, but then again, he didn't have enough time to react to it as the darkness had already invaded the city. Lane commands her copies, who have no intent to kill Yogiri, to head on into the city and test something out for her. She orders her copies to head into the city and rush it as soon as the darkness exhibits any strange behavior. Meanwhile, Tomochika asks Yogiri if he can handle something like the dark monster plaguing their city. Yogiri lets her know that he can, 
and this surprises her. Yogiri proceeds with his plan, despite having a bad feeling about things, and orders the darkness to die. Before he could finish his attack, the copies of Lion fell into the city and blew up everywhere. Just then, Tomochika recognizes the lady crashing into the city, and describes Lane to Ryuta and Yogiri. Yogiri suddenly gets the idea behind the swarm of attacks that came on the city, right after he ordered the death of the darkness. Apparently, this was Lane's way of countering his attacks, so he wouldn't have enough time to order her copies to die before they hit the ground. Ryuta and Tomochika do a quick run-through of Lane's abilities so they can deduce a way to beat her at her own game before she ends them all. Yogiri admits that things would be much easier if Lane were to attack him directly rather than the buildings and people around him. At that instant, someone blasts an emergency evacuation over the speakers and orders the citizens to leave the premises before it is too late. Ryuta takes out a hologram of the entire city and analyzes the attack patterns that have been ravaging the city. They deduce that if they wait enough in an open area, then Line will eventually show herself to Yogiri and fight them fair and square. With this, Yogiri turns his back to leave for the spot, but then again, Ryuta isn't going to let him go alone. To help them save time, he teleports Yogiri and Tomochika to a safe spot in the city and leaves them there to wait lying out. The attacks on the city grew larger and larger until Yogiri and Tomochika could spot an isolated copy of Line. Yogiri has Moko Moko cover them with a special encasing so Yogiri can be protected against the attacks. Thankfully this works, and Yogiri escapes the fight scot-free after taking down the copy with his words. Mokomoko then goes on a rant to talk about the special fabric she got from an aggressor earlier which saved them back then. As she continues yapping on, all of Lian's copies disappear into thin air. Lian gets a little concerned over how Yogiri could destroy immortal beings with just his word. She rests easy knowing that her body is still safe from the original attack, and then goes on to mouth a few things she would do when creating her next clones. Just then, her body goes stiff, and Lian quickly realizes that Yogiri has killed her body from another dimension. She falls to the ground and disappears into nothingness after losing her life. With the attacks on the city evaded and Lian did, a certain girl who's been placed in a coffin and left unconscious wakes up as the candles in her room light up. She finds an orb in her hands and looks at it to listen to a message from the real lion warning her never to fight Yogiri Takatu in her lifetime, as it could prove dangerous to her in the long run. The little lady thanks her former self for the warning and goes on to live life. The following day, Tomachika and Ryuta thanked each other for helping themselves out. Once they're done, Tomochika boards an armored car with Yogiri and Mokomoko, and then drives them out of there. That night, a few sages from Yogiri's clash finish, taking down a monster, and their leader, Ryuko, heads back to her camp only to find Karol there waiting for them. Before bashing her for breaking into her room, Ryuko takes a look at her phone, which was in Carol's hand at the time, and asks for it back. When she asks Carol what she is using her phone for, Carol bluntly tells her she is using it to monitor Takatu as an American ninja, from the former world they were in. Ryuko asks her why they never had their monitoring system, and Carol tells her it's because their satellite wasn't good enough for them to use here in this new world. As such, they must resort to stealing the phones of other students so they can monitor Takatu's movements. Ryuko gets her phone back and finds an alert telling her about the Alpha Omega door that just opened. Ryuko opens her eyes, surprised almost as if a once-in-a-lifetime event had just happened. Tomochika and Yogiri ride the armored car to the mountainous paths leading to the royal capital of the nation. Along the way, Tomochika experiences some turbulence while driving the heavy vehicle through the feeble platforms by the side of the mountain. As she struggles to keep the armored car on the road, she looks to her left and finds Yogiri sleeping soundly through the entire thing. She complains a lot about Yogiri's odd sleeping habit and wishes he could be more alert in situations like the one that happened on the bus and the one they're in now. Mokomoko steps out from the back seat and tries to wake Yogiri up, all to no avail. Tomochika, who had already taken her mind off the road, spots a rock ahead of her and realizes she has no time to properly break the car without hitting the rock even in the slightest. While this happens, Yogiri gets even further into his dream, where young Yogiri and his teacher at the time, Asaka, were shaking hands, and Asaka was giving him a name. After naming him Yogiri Takatu, she holds his hand and teaches him how to say, nice to meet you. For some context, a flashback to the time when Yogiri was way younger is illustrated. That's where Asaka Takatu comes in. Asaka was an experienced teacher with lots of years dedicated to making sure children get the care, love, and support they need to survive the harsh world. She'd heard about the job offer and came down to the facility to try her luck. After giving the interview her all, Asaka finally gets picked by Yogiri's handler. To have her fully stated in the job, a scientist there called Yukio has her sign a non-disclosure agreement, making her promise not to complain or say anything, 
even if she dies on the job. Asaka noticed something weird with this sort of NDA and tried to return to her home for her safety. However, Yukio couldn't let her go now that she's seen too much, so he grabs her hand and cajoles her to sign the NDA before taking her further into the facility. On their way down, Asaka asks Yukio about the nature of the organization she was about to work with. Apparently, she thought them to be some sort of evil organization, but then Yukio tells her, they're just an organization that conducts experiments for the betterment of the human race. Asaka gets a little more curious and asks Yukio to tell her what she's going to be doing there. Yukio bursts her bubble and tells her she's to take care of the monster in the facility. Together, the duo take an elevator down to a sublevel to get to Yogiri's room. Upon arriving at the sublevel, Asaka is faced with a corridor with very strange and unreal red paintings on the wall. Yukio calls the paintings a scripture and says it works as consolation for people like him. At this point, Asaka gets very freaked out and scared as they walk through the corridor and board another elevator to get to a much lower level than the one they're already on. On their way down, Yukio takes out a pamphlet and shows five Japanese characters on it. The characters which translates to Alpha Omega, confuse Asaka a little bit, and Yukio asks about her understanding of the characters. Asaka tells him there's no way she knows the characters. Yukio then sheds more light on the characters and tells her that they're the beginning and the end of the Grecian alphabet. In other words, it means everything or eternity, and that's the code name of the test subject she's going to be taking care of. They get off that elevator and board a final one down to the basement. There, Yukio lets Asaka in on the truly horrifying powers of the Alpha Omega, and urges her to take good care of him. Asaka's face brightens with fear as she hears the intentions behind her doing her job. Eventually, they get to the lowest level of the building and Yukio gives Asaka the pamphlet containing instructions before leaving. Asaka uses her keycard to open the door to Yogari's special room and is surprised to find how otherworldly the room is. She checks the pamphlet for the map and finds a single structure in the middle of the room. She gets to the room and sees herself in the house. After checking the house out and asking for inhabitants, Asaka finally hears a rumble somewhere and goes over to check it out. On getting there, she meets young Yogiri and gets super pissed at his handlers for keeping a child deep underground. Without fail, she carries Yogiri and heads outside so she can play with him. Seeing as the door outside the room can't be found again, Asaka decides Yogiri must play outside like normal kids do, and she is going to force him to do it. Right outside, Yogiri kills Asaka's shadow demon that is standing just beside her and saves her from a world of hurt. Asaka looks back and asks Yogiri what the shadow is doing behind her. Young Yogiri tells her that the thing is a demon that sometimes sneaks into his room to try and kill him. Yogiri reminds her that it's dark already, so playing outside may not be the best thing for him at the moment. Asaka apologizes for her weird behavior and holds his hands up. Then, she introduces herself as Asaka Takatu and asks for Yogiri's name. Yogiri calls himself Alpha Omega, as his handlers normally call him. With this, Asaka gets a little weirded out over such a horrible code name, so she asks him to tell her the name he was called before he was captured and placed in the facility. Yogiri tells her he used to be called Lord Okakushi and tells her about his hungry self. Asaka also gets very hungry and realizes that part of her job is also cooking. So, she returns to the house and searches it all for some pre-packed meal while Yogiri takes his evening bath. After searching for 10 minutes straight, Asaka finally finds some cup noodles. She boils some water and prepares the ramen in it to feed herself and Yogiri. Once the food is ready, both teacher and student dig in, and Yogiri feels the deliciousness of the chewy noodles. While they eat, Asaka gets a little curious and asks Yogiri about his mother. Confused, Yogiri asks her what a mother is. Asaka gets the memo and stops her questioning to think about a more suitable name for a young dude like him. Eventually, she comes up with Yogiri and calls him that after likening his face to that of a cute little puppy. Yogiri immediately takes her last name and calls himself Takatu Yogiri. And although Asaka is isn't that okay with it. She still accepts his friendship. She also teaches him a few more welcome speeches and leaves him to do his thing. Around that time in the real world, Tomochika was already sick and tired of Yogiri sleeping his arse out, so she woke him up and pulled him out of the dream he was in. Yogiri wakes up and finds himself in the armored car, which was parked in front of the blockade. Everyone, including Mokomoko, complained about the blockade, but then again, Yogiri thought hard about another route. He realized that they don't have to get to the royal capital to see Shion the Seiji, and they can always find another route to take. Tomochika stops him and argues that they may be obliged to get there seeing as most of their other students are going there as well. For now, though, they have to get their car away from the blockade, and they get down to it. Tomochika reverses the car and hits a dragon-like creature waiting for them there. Tomochika and Yogiri step out of the vehicle and find the dragon threatening to end them. 
Yogiri commands the dragon to die, and then finds the other dragons coming their way. Yogiri commands all of them to die as well and continues doing his thing. Just when they thought the danger was over, another golden dragon showed up and threatened to end them. This time, the dragon checks them out and flies away after seeing Yogiri's power. Before it gets too far, Yogiri commands it to wait and return to them, or it will face the same fate as the other dragons. The dragon stops midair and transforms into a little girl upon getting back on land. Yogiri and Tomochika question the girl on her intentions towards them, and the little girl says she was there to check them out if they were qualified to see the Swordmaster. Confused, both Tomochika and Yogiri ask her who the Swordmaster is. The girl was a little taken aback by this, but then again, she calmed down to explain the gift the Swordmaster will bestow to anybody who passed the exams. Yogiri tells her he's not interested in her games and preps himself to leave. The little girl begs him and tells Yogiri that the Swordmaster has power that surpasses that of a sage. This revelation piques the interest of Yogiri in the Swordmaster, so he decides to go check him out and ask him a few questions about Shion and this world they're in. The little girl introduces herself as Atila and hops in the car with the others to get to the top of the mountain after promising to take them to the royal capital. On their way, there, Attila keeps shouting out the Swordmaster's name, and when they get there, everyone gives them stares. One of the cocky people there challenges Yogiri to a fight, but thankfully, the Swordmaster himself, Urabi, shows up and calms the atmosphere down. He complains about the high number of students there and orders them to kill each other until their number is reduced by half the amount. Yogiri asks if he can sit out the fight, but then again, Urabe forbids him and anybody from doing such a thing. With that, the fight begins and everyone goes in for the kill. Yogiri and Tomochika try to sit the fight out, but then, three people come at him to attack him. Before he uses his powers, a knight in shining armor shows up and saves Yogiri. Yogiri also finds some set of people hiding in the trees to attack them and quickly attacks them before they finish their magic spell. The knight gets a little surprised and asks about what happened. Tomochika tried to explain Yogiri's powers to him, but thankfully, the knight was a bit too dense to realize that Yogiri killed the dudes behind the tree. Moving on, one of the dudes who was slain earlier crawls towards a gleaming stone and begs Tomochika to give it to him. Tomochika helps him with the stone, and he uses it to revive himself back to normal. Surprised, Tomochika asks the weirdo what happened, but then Urabe is already done with the culling. He orders the survivors to follow him to another part of the forest, and this leaves Yogiri and Tomochika confused. Attila begs them to go with the flow and become night warriors, so she can be their follower. With this, Tomochika and Yogiri press on with their new friends, Rick, the knight in shining armor, and Linnell, the dude with the magic gleaming stone. On their way to the next location for the test, Rick gives a brief description of the Dark God. About a thousand years ago, the Divine King sealed the Dark God with his own hands in a purple orb just to keep evil away from the Earth. Moving on to Tomochika, she looks at Linnell and asks him to explain what the Apology Stones mean. Linnell tells her that the stone was given to him as an apology from the goddess for always granting him bad luck. So, anytime he uses a stone, he can revive himself from any injury. Linnell also shows off other qualities of the stone and throws his last three stones to get an item from the gods. Surprised, Tomochika asks him about what happens now that he has nothing left. Linnell tells her he gets new stones every night by midnight. Just then, they pass through the barrier and appear in another part of the world. There, Mokomoko feels a very strong evil miasma and tells her people to get the hell out of there before it's too late for them. Linnell even vomits out some glitter, but thankfully, nothing happens to him in the long run. Soon enough, the miasma disappears and Yogiri struggles to find Attila. Eventually, they realize she can't pass through there, so they walk into the tall structure in front of them and use the elevator to take all of them to the top of the building. There, Urabi shows them the large purple ball housing the sealed bodies of the Divine King and the Dark Lord. He tells them the same backstory Rick told Yogiri, but as he's about to finish it, a headstrong warrior named Frederica shows up and shoots a fireball at the purple miasma. To her surprise, her ball slows down due to the time-slowing effect of the miasma, and Urabe explains it to her before starting the selection test. The instructor tells them to get to the first floor of the building in 24 hours, and also make sure to earn 100 points on their way down. She adds some special participants and waits for the signal to start the descent. Yogiri, who was looking seriously worried, whispered something into Tomochika's ears about the miasma they felt from earlier, and this made 